Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, Ask the Experts um, for, series from Riveron. We'll get started here in a minute or two. Give everybody time to log in. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome again to uh, Riveron's Ask the Experts webinar series. Um, this is Mark Cox, uh, Managing Director um, from our Chicago office. Uh, we are here today to discuss uh, CECL, Current Expected Credit Losses, um, ASC 326. I have with me here um, Steve Manko, one of our directors, uh, one of our managing directors. Even a quick intro. Hey, good, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. I'm looking forward to the conversation today. Um, as, as we'll talk about as we go forward, this is a, a live webcast, so there will be polling and CPE, but also an opportunity for everyone to submit questions. So to the extent possible, feel free to interject and submit a question as we go down through the process. We can have a bit of a dialogue going back and forth over the next 60 minutes. So looking forward to it. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks, Steve. So we'll, we'll just jump right into it here. Um, so some key reminders, Steve touched on this. Um, there will be four polling questions. In order to obtain the CPE, um, you will have to answer all four polling questions. Um, in order to get the polling questions, you will have to turn off your pop-up blockers. We've had this uh, come up several times in previous webinars, so please go in and turn off your pop-up blockers if available. Um, in terms of your CPE certificate, uh, a webinar evaluation form and your certificate will be emailed out to you. Um, usually it's about a week after the webinar. If you are not seeing it after a period of time, please feel free to reach out um, to Riveron um, through our website and we will be sure to get that to you. Um, there will not be on demand um, for this. Uh, there will be on demand, but it will not be available for CPE. Um, so the, the recording will be available if it's needed. Um, and it will be followed up in an email as well. Just want to make sure everyone has um, everything they need to, to get the CP, you know how important that is. So we'll jump right into um, our polling question first. This will just set the tone for us here. Um, you know, how well do you know Cecil? A, not at all. B, not very well. C, working knowledge. Or D, extensively. Um, so I'll go ahead and give a little bit of time here. Steve, you want to you know, give some anecdotes as to what you've heard in terms of um, what, what you expect to hear for people now? Yeah, I'm a bit surprised probably, and I think everyone probably is saying that we might have some answers more so in the, the A and B category at this part in time. But um, as we know, that's the reality of, of where we are with um, some of the other ASCs that were recently issued that a number of companies are still dealing with and have been dealing with over the, the past few years. So uh, we'll touch on it a little bit more as we go down through and some of the possible extensions of time for adoption for non-public entities. But, um, you know, still we're getting close to, to the deadline and the adoption deadline. Uh, but I think we'll, we'll see with this poll and, and kind of the context and content of the presentation today that we're still towards the beginning point of really understanding on what this really means especially for organizations outside of financial services. Um, so what we're, that's why we're having this, this type of webcast today to make sure we're educating people and hopefully walking away with not only an understanding but some applicable steps on how to get moving on this um, depending on where they are in the adoption process. Yeah, thank you very much, Steve, for that. And I think uh, obviously the FASB has been busy over the last several years um, with ASC 606, yep. ASC 842, yep. um, and then ASC 326 coming very shortly thereafter. So a lot of a lot of entities are fatigued um, exactly. with this type of uh, big changes. So, you know, we're going to talk on the high level here. Um, hopefully we'll, you know, this relief that has come out previously we'll touch on. Um, there will be some relief for private companies, but we'll touch on that in, uh, in a short period of time. So we'll give a couple more moments for people to answer polling questions, then we'll, we'll get rolling.
Yeah, I mean, go back to the point you made, Mark. I really don't remember a time in my career where there were such substantial changes to accounting standards. Um, I haven't been around forever, but you know, a decade and a half at least, and just the burden that was been putting on organizations. I don't remember a time when it's been like this. So, you know, there's there's a reality out there of just people doing their day jobs and then being burdened with this overlap of so many standards and um, clarity on what this really means. And I'm I'm still shocked that. We are where we are today, knowing that uh, early in my career, I've been following Cecil ever since some of the developments on you know, things back in 2012 when there was discussion on how this would work together with U.S. GAAP and international accounting standards as well. So it's, it's amazing that those discussions, at least for me personally, were happening back in, in 2011 and 2012 when I was polling organizations on where they thought the convergence might take place. Um, and as most of us know, it, that didn't take place, and the international standards went in their own direction and actually started adopting this much earlier than what we're seeing in the U.S. But lesson to be learned, uh, I know most of those international organizations, when they were doing IFRS 9, they were hoping to run parallel with their models well before adoption. And lesson learned from that is that just did not happen with those organizations. So. Um, I think the good thing is, as we'll talk about with maybe some deferral of the dates for these private companies, probably was the right decision to, to make or that will be made, just given, once again, the burden and the knowledge that needed to be gained by these organizations that just were not familiar with really an impact on what credit really means to their organization. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Yeah, as you can see, some of these, uh, some of the results should be on your screen here. Um, you know, a large portion um, of the registrants, uh, the web webinar, um, actually have not read the standard. So hopefully by the end of it, we can change that and you can move to maybe even not very well. Um, yep. We'd be happy to uh, help you there. So we'll, we'll keep rolling here and talk a little bit about um, kind of what's, what is in scope. Or, or just really, Steve, maybe you, you laid some of the groundwork there. Why? did FASB decide to go this route? To be large, substantial change for some entities, but maybe talk a little bit about why are we here? Yep, just, just real quick, so everyone can remember the financial crisis um, and what happened with organizations, and mostly we can talk about some of the, the banks and other financial institutions that went down during that time. So people were looking for a reason of, of why that happened, and some of it could be because of, of business practices and lending and underwriting that was taking place at the time. But another thing that from an accounting standard or accounting perspective that could change outside of business practices would be how were organizations recording losses or preparing for losses at that point in time. Now, I think we can all go back and forth on whatever accounting standard or, or pronouncement that's out there. There's always dialogue back and forth on how effective any accounting pronouncement really is. But going back to our good old college days of learning accounting and, and gap reporting, Really what we're looking for and aiming for is comparability and consistency between organizations. So you can criticize maybe the ASC 450 model that was being applied at that point in time for recording credit losses, uh, but the main point was to have comparability between organizations. Now, as we know with ASC 450, the shortfall on that is really you can't go out over an extended period of, t of time to really develop an extensive loss um, expectation. You may be doing that internally with pricing, which banks do when they price their lending products, but from really an accounting perspective, you can't build for that. And if you think about how a reserve is built, a reserve is built through basically a, a reduction of earnings, if you will, oftentimes called a provision. So as you build an allowance, you're increasing your expenses, if you will. Um, so that's really reducing your capital. And as your assets get riskier, that's also requiring an additional capital allocation. So you're kind of getting hit with it, uh, doubling up at a point in time when things are going to go bad. So what the FASB thought with talking with others within the industries and, and understanding what went wrong at that point in time, there really needs to be a way to start building additional allowances, determining the capital that will be required, and doing that over a longer period to start building those buffers earlier than just within the one year of when this would likely be happening. Because once again, financial services organizations are really just covering losses for 12 to 18 months, and that's really, to a certain extent, all they were allowed to do. Uh, all good points, Steve. And I think you know, some of the big things to think about really um, – they have a lot of the entities that suffered these losses. I think the feeling was that they had data to understand maybe a future 
Um, and so uh, the FASB made a call based on understanding what was out in the market and that we needed more clarity. Yep, that's right. But once again, you know, going back from my auditor days, entities weren't allowed to really build a reserve under the, the current accounting standards that were in place at that point in time. So they, even if they really wanted to, there was a fine line with how much they could really look and forecast into the future to do so. Yeah, yeah, good point, good point. So maybe talk a little bit about what's in scope um, for CSOM. Sure. So that's why there's a, a pretty easy breakdown of uh, different items that are that are in scope for CECL. Um, hopefully, people are somewhat familiar with what's in scope. Um, you know, from what we've seen, you know, it's, it's typical things like the financing receivables or loans, um, which you know that's really getting the focus of, of what is coming into CECL. So we will be talking about that a lot today. Um, held to maturity securities that won't impact as many organizations, but you know, also there's a lot of, there's a credit component to those, so those came in. Um, going back to trade receivables, another focus today, entities outside of the financial services industries will have these trade receivables that come into scope. Um, and then some other things that are probably people are, are less familiar with, like reinsurance receivables, um, leases, and these off balance sheet uh, credit exposures as well. Now on the right side, we're not gonna list and talk through all those items that are out of the scope for this, the one thing that I did want to mention that there people may have heard, those that are somewhat familiar with CSOL, that there are changes coming to the available for sale debt securities model. We're not going to be focusing on that much today. Um, it's kind of being lumped in with the different ASUs or the similar ASU that's coming through with changing the overall CSOL in 326. Um, but yeah, there are changes there. We're not focusing on that today. Um, and we'll talk about that separately in a, in a future Ask the Experts webinar. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, Steve, talk a little bit about some of the key differences. I think that the big one that we've heard a lot is moving from an incurred loss model to an expected loss model, but maybe really talk a little bit about what incurred meant. You know, so a lot of the people in the, the banking financial institution world, it wasn't, it was more of a expected incurred, um, you know, as a loss became highly probable, right? That's right. You, you incurred it then, um, but maybe talk a little bit about that difference between what that looks like now versus sure. previous. Sure. And once again, that kind of goes back to just the, the handcuffs that organizations were with that they couldn't even go out and, and build for those future expected ones in, in the majority of circumstances. So, what does it mean for you know incurred versus expected? Um, you know, organizations like I said, maybe we're covering if you were a financial services organization. 12, 18, maybe 24 months of losses, and there had to be some indication going back to ASC 450 that a loss was out there. Um, with what we'll talk about later on with the, the pooling impact, uh, a lot of these organizations, like a bank had so many loans, you're not gonna look at every loan individually, but you pull them together, and in doing so, history would tell you that you're gonna have some sort of loss coming through. Now, you don't know exactly which loan specifically is going to come through with a loss, you know, usually on, on day one, these organizations are, are lending credit with an expectation that the majority of it that will be repaid and not knowing exactly which one will default or have a loss going forward. But at some point in time, that will take place. But you had to kind of put it together with an expectation, not knowing exactly which one will be there, but having a knowledge that someone at some point in time will. So that was more of the, you know, incur loss model under 450, which really prevented you from looking out too far. That's why you only had a short-term build that was out there on, on what your losses could be. So I guess a, one way to summarize it would be simply, you weren't building a loss in on day one. You know, and I think it's what people were seeing that were outside of financial services. Usually you're aging your receivables by current zero to 30, 31 to 60 and so forth. And oftentimes you're not building a reserve for those ones that are current. And that's essentially what was happening, if you want to think of it, and what the change is. Going forward today, you'll be building a loss in on day one when you book that receivable. Yeah, yeah, very good point. Um, you know, so a, a couple of other key differences, um, and maybe talk a little bit about the unit of measure. I, I think what we've seen in practice is a lot of companies were already pooling, but maybe talk a little bit about from legacy to 326, what the what the difference is between unit of measurement. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting because we say legacy was permitted but not required, and, and now say it is required. So it's an interesting topic to talk about. I think the part is, and, and I want to make sure people are aware of this, you may have been pooling in the past, 
but as we'll talk about going forward, um, depending on the level and, and volume of receivables you have or whatever instrument that we're talking about is in play and the scope for CECL that impacts you, oftentimes pooling does make the most sense for, just from an efficiency standpoint. And especially when it was the legacy guidance because you didn't know exactly which security would default and have a loss going forward. What we'll see different today though, and you may say, oh, well, I'm already pooling, so I'm already familiar with this. The change is though, depending on how you pool, will impact really the impact CECL is going to have on you going forward. Now, what do I mean by that? Depending on who you are, you really want to understand, in my opinion, just from running a business and putting the accounting aside for a second, what do your receivables look like? And, and the better you pull those receivables and, and the more granular you pull those receivables, will really make sure that you understand what your portfolio looks like. From there, then you can start applying the right expectations, the right methodology, the right numbers and, and units on how you're applying these losses, but it really comes down to how are you pooling and the granularity of pooling. So I would really encourage people to think about that. Do you understand your portfolio? You may have been lumping everything together, but really challenge yourself without any undue cost or effort, but really start pooling yourselves or pooling your, your receivables, I should say, in a more applicable method to really understand your receivables and that may evolve into having a few more methodologies in play than you had than you had previously to uh, estimate what your losses could be but it really will help you understand your business better yeah yeah and I think we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that as we talk about what the, the Cecil measurement process will be and, and dig in a little bit more there you know some of the one of the items you already mentioned to you was the consideration of the economic conditions you know legacy gap allowed for a short-term current economic view, right. and CECL is going to require a, a future expectations from management as well as economic conditions. Yep, and you know, it's funny because we talk about, you can split the room on, on the applicability or, or how good a, an accounting standard or pronouncement really is, and, and part of the goal was for more transparency and consistency to come out through this. Um, you know, so, so my critique or, or my, um, negative thought on, on the standard would be when you're building in an element of forecasting, that's always going to make things a little bit more unpredictable. And I understand why the forecasting element is built in to you know, start hopefully absorbing or building for those losses in advance of them coming through under 450. Uh, but as we know about forecasts, you know, the majority of forecasts are always wrong. Another good thing about the standard, I guess, is that there isn't one required method to do just about anything within the standard, whether it's looking back, looking forward, looking current, just about anything is acceptable as long as you, as you can support why you are doing it. But once again, if we're looking for consistency and, and being transparent on what you're doing, I'm just not sure we're going to get there with, without a lot of effort up front and, and first. So it will be interesting to see after adoption. Uh, what some of the SEC comments are that come out for the public entities on trying to encourage more disclosures on really how transparent are they so we can understand how things are really being built and what your forecast really looks like. Yeah, and I mean a lot of this is how far do we does management want to go in these expectations, how much do they want to build out, how much do Absolutely. they want to disclose. Absolutely. Um, and we'll talk about the disclosures toward the end um, of the webinar. Yep. Um, and so the, the last kind of key difference is consideration of the contractual term wasn't previously part of the calculation um, under legacy gap, but now it is part of the measurement process. Right. Absolutely. And so the, the best way I can describe it is, you know, you weren't recording a loss on day one. And if, if history goes back to certain loans, you know, history would show that typically if you have, let's call it a seven year loan, um, there's not a lot of default that takes place in the first year or two, right? Um, usually you're doing some pretty good diligence and underwriting standards, so not a lot, a lot of losses come through one, two. Your probability of default usually goes up if we're just talking from, you know, aging or vintage perspective in years three, four, or five of a loan. And then that's really the critical time period. And if you get to year six and seven, the probability of default kind of comes down again because if the borrower's been paying and, and operating for, for five years, there's probably a good chance that they'll continue paying a loan over year six and seven as well. Um, but if you, like I said, so if you have a year that's in a loan that's in years one and two, you're likely to have no reserve on that. Depending on the model you're using, there may be a reserve applied, even though it's, it's a good loan in years three, four, and five, just because of what the probability of default might be. 
the change for today is that's going to take everything together, forget about what time period the loan currently is in and on day one, build that probability of default in on day one as opposed to waiting until day one of, of year three. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about kind of short-term receivables and what that means. Obviously, short-term receivables don't really have a contractual term on them. They've got a payment sure. date. Yep. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, bit further on the webinar. Yeah. One thing I'd like to highlight, you know, before we move on, this is just once again an opportunity for accounting to work together with the business and so many other departments within the organization to really understand whatever asset that we're talking about that, that's in scope, whether it's you know trade receivables, loans, or, or whatever we're discussing here, because you need to be making business decisions. And this is an opportunity to enhance those business decisions. You know, I hate, I, even though I'm an accountant and that's what I was trained to do, I hate thinking about accounting driving business decisions. I really hope that it's business decisions more so driving the accounting decisions as well. But because this will be for a majority of institutions, even though some people may not believe it, a bigger impact than what they think. I think it's a time well spent that you need to get together with the various departments within your organization that may be impacted um, and think about the right business decisions to make as you have this fresh start on thinking about the way you're doing things. Yeah, good. Accounting standards changes are always a good way to look at the overall process. Let's Absolutely. reassess the processes, and I know a lot of our uh, clients have done that with 606. They've done that with 842. Yep. It use it as an opportunity to improve a process yep. um, because you already have to change it as part of this. And 326 lets you refine. Once again, it's very open to what you want to do. It lets you refine as you go through at any point in time. But, man, it's, we always know it's more efficient to do things right the first time when you can. Yeah, absolutely. And so we'll talk a little bit about effective dates. So for for SEC filers, um, filing after for annual period starting after 12, 15, 19. So for calendar year ends 1-1-2020, one, one, um, CECL is in effect. So if you're, I can create your appointment if you already have one. Oh the, public, <laughs> the public companies are able to, uh, should be starting on this right now. Um, and so if you're... I'm not sure I got it right. Uh, if you're able to continue this process, uh, you would really have a, a way to jump into and do some process improvement. Um, so it's 1-1-2020 one, one, for SEC filers, some really big news uh, for other entities um, and the other PBEs, which if you want the definition of the other PBEs, the best place to look at is the SEC Financial Reporting Manual, um, Equity Method Investees uh, that are part of SEC filing. But really good news came out that the FASB has issued an exposure draft to delay the um, transition period for private entities. Um, and maybe talk a little bit about what you think the, the reasoning for that was. I mean, I know what the FASB said, it's sure. complex, um, and leases and derivatives and others were included. Yep. Um, but maybe just talk a little bit about your thoughts around that. Yep. Well, I think it goes back to what I said about IFRS 9, and we saw that, that the majority of those foreign institutions didn't even have a chance to do parallel runs before it was adopted, um, and let alone some of them weren't even doing model validation before the adoption period. Uh, so it was interesting to see this talk about a deferral taking place. Once again, that hasn't been officially approved yet. Um, we do think that that's what the case will be. Um, and, and in this case, I don't want people to think that they can always delay their diligence going forward with new accounting pronouncements that are coming out. So I don't think this will be a trend that we'll see continual delays and other pronouncements out there. But once again, like we hit on, this probably is the right decision to make sure that people are appropriately assessing what the impact is, especially with those organizations that have fatigue that was coming out from the past whatever number of years, three, four, five years of preparing for additional standards that came into play. So I think this probably is the right decision to be made out there. Now, what I would warn is, once again, if you're a public organization, you don't get the deferral. You're still supposed to be out there working, and I hope you're working through that process right now, and you're not just starting it and getting going on this, because it will be much more than, than many anticipate. And if you're one of them that is fortunate enough that will get this deferral period, as we talked about, 
what a, what a chance for you to really understand your business, understand your receivables or whatever instrument work you're talking about that impacts you, and thinking about a way to improve your overall business process and organization by taking the time to work across with other departments and think about the way to uh, properly adopt this and change the business going forward. Yep, yep, good point, Steve. So we'll jump into the second polling question now. Um, what type of assets uh, does your company have that are in scope of the new standards? We talked a little bit about this uh, as part of uh, the, the in scope. So let, let's jump into the polling here and just and just see what people say. You know, I think expectations wise, I, I assume most everyone on this call has trade receivables. I would I would expect that, um, but. I also expect there's a lot of companies that have multiple types of assets. Sure. You know, what are, what are you thinking, Steve? Yeah, I think you're spot on, and, and we do have a, a pretty good representation of cross industries on this today, so it'll, it'll be interesting to see um, the majority or, or the weightedness towards type of industry. But, but once again, I think people are, are going to be, everyone, just about everyone, I should say, will be impacted in some way, shape, or form. Hopefully, people are realizing that. Hopefully, at least they've done some sort of scoping to see what, what type of assets are coming in to be impacted and thinking about that. Yep. Yeah. And, you know. So, so we'll um, we'll give it another another few seconds here um, for the attendees to chime in. So we'll share the results here and kind of talk through these um, just a bit. Uh, so it looks like a large portion has expected trade receivables. Uh, a few entities do have finance receivables loans. Uh, and then another large portion has multiple types of assets, but I think uh, none of the above. I, I mean, I think there, there's a large portion of, you know, maybe service providers on here that are answering none of the above. But the, the entities, um, if you're answering none of the above, you know, I challenge you to take a look at the scope of the standard um, and understand if your assets are out there or, you know, have a third party help you um, at least scope your balance sheet to understand if you do have assets that are in scope. I think we have a pretty smart audience, so I'm going to guess that the nut would probably be the, the service providers that are on there um, answering the polling question for CPE. Sure, sure. So we'll, we'll, we'll get moving here and talk a little bit more um, about the actual process. So we're going we're gonna to dig into these five, so we're not going to touch on them here, um, but you can see that these are the the expectations for how you measure uh, under ASC 326. So we'll, we'll jump right into the first one here. So grouping financial assets uh, based on similar characteristics. So determining unit of account. We touched on it a little bit, sure. Steve, but maybe maybe talk about it. You know, what are you looking like from a financial institution? But you know, what about somebody that just has trade receivables? Exactly. So you know, I, I think we're going to jump into this section here and try to simplify some of the the guidance that's out there. I think the ASU itself was like 273 pages after you printed it out. So this is where we're going to hopefully get back um, out of the theory and into the applicability to the organization to help you think about it. So pooling is very important. Um, and as, as to answer Mark's question, we have some examples of the different unit of accounts that you can use to determine. It's very flexible on how you want to go about and doing things. Um, oftentimes, I would say if you would look down to you know trade receivables or something like that, you would look at maybe credit worthiness or duration aging and past due. So you know rows two and four on the table on the right, um, that's what typically non-banks would do to look at their receivables. So I think what you'll see is some pooling, if you will. I'll use that loosely by just the days past due. So. From the disclosures we've seen on public companies, that's often what it is, that there's you know, current zero to 30, so on and so forth by days past due. I guess that's one way of pooling, but I would, I would challenge organizations to really think further and looking at some of these other risk characteristics that are going to be utilized to really determine the best way to pool your trade receivables. On the flip side, you have banks and organizations like that that, that typically would say, you know, in, in probably a pretty accurate order, they would go down and, and make a pool and they would say, okay, well, what, what type of customer do I have? Is it is it a consumer? Is it a commercial? So that's one way to, to start and separate your receivables into two pools right there. And then from there you say, well, what industry do they work in? Uh, from there they'd say, is there a type of collateral? Is there a geography? And then maybe all the way down on the commercial side or even consumer side if we're talking uh, residential mortgages to a loan to value ratio. So I think that we would expect 
financial services organizations to be a little bit more complex in the way they want to do that. Since that's how they're pricing their receivables, and that's very important to how they run their business. Um, but to a certain extent, I would encourage other organizations outside of, of, of banks, let's say, to really uh, dig a bit deeper into the way that you're pooling to once again really understand the types of receivables you have and the types of risks that you have. Because yeah. if we get to the end, you're going to have to talk about that in your disclosures. And we'll still, still see you know, what the SEC's expectations are, what the auditor's expectations really are, and how the guidance is applied. But there are more robust disclosures that no matter what type of organization you are, we want the reader to really understand the credit risk in your portfolio. Yeah, yeah good, good point. I mean, you can see some of the, the types of risk characteristics. These are not, by all means, all inclusive. Right. Um, but I think a good thing to think about here is working with the credit department at your entity. Uh, how are they evaluating risk, uh, even when they're entering into new agreements with short-term uh, customers where you're not going to have a loan? How is your credit department looking at the risk of that customer? That may lead you down the path as to how you delineate or pool your assets. Right. And this could be leveraged upon hopefully some of the improvements that were made, you know, from the application of, of RubRec and 606 that you know, people were challenging the way that the sales were taking place and the contracts were being originated. And hopefully some of those improved processes for consistency can also be used to help you develop the pools for your trade receivables as well. Yeah, and I, you know, thinking about um, short-term receivables, I think one thing to keep in mind is this will be a, a, one of the hyper-focused areas uh, for the auditors because it's one area where you can really dig in yep. and get a very pointed estimate yep. um, if you have the right historical data, which we'll talk about yep. in the future. So just one thing to think about if you're one, uh, <clears throat> an entity out there that only has the short-term trade receivables, really keep in mind that this area is, a, is an area that you can actually save yourself from time yep. by really refining that estimate and multiple risk characteristics within your portfolio. Unless you're some small company with really one product generating your revenue, I would say that you need to at least go, you know, aging would be a place to start and that's fine, but breaking it down by at least one more risk characteristic is what the expectation will be going forward. Yep, perfect. So we'll jump into the second here so that, you know, there's a lot, a lot of judgment involved, as you said, within CECL, uh, ASC 326 allows that. Um, but maybe talk about some of the methods that ASC 326 talks about for actually measuring yep. losses here. And I'm going to talk about this quickly, but we can do a whole webcast on this one, but I'll talk about the ones that, that are more applicable since we're, we're pressed for time. And I'll start on what we'll call maybe the, the low complexity and the loss rates. And there are various ways to do a loss rate, but you know, a simple way would be just to think about what are your actual losses or charge-offs or whatever you want to call it, bad debt expense over time given the average balance that was out there and you can do that over a monthly period, an annual period, and the look back period to kind of annualize it and, and average it out. But it's really just determining of my balances that are out there, what is the average rate that I'm going to use in, in trying to annualize that. Aging, like I talked about, that's what we see a lot right now on, on the zero to 30 that's past due or, or what's current. And then I would say the ones for banks and other complex organizations that have some sophistication. I was raised working on the banks and I'm more familiar with the PDLGD. That's the one that makes the most sense to me. Um, but once again, if that's not what's really driving your business, then it may not make sense for the majority of the organizations on this call to go to a PDG, PDLGD model. Um, I think one thing to think about, it also makes sense to do that model if you have something with collateral because even if you go out and look at, at Moody's and bond ratings and default rates and things like that, there's a difference between the probability of default, the loss given default, the cumulative loss that happens. And just because something defaults, if there's collateral behind it, it may not have a significant loss that goes along with it to where if it's more a consumer base where there isn't collateral, default usually leads to a pretty large charge off as well. So um, that would be one thing to think about. Um, it's more complex, in my opinion. It may be more accurate. It's the one I was raised with, and, and I like the most. But um, if you're not a bank or an organization like that, I would expect you would be on the low complexity on aging and loss rate. I think that's more than appropriate. Sure, sure. And I think, you know, thinking about there is, you know, one small nuance here. If you if you're using a discounted cash flow method for the, you know, the, the longer term assets. Um, in terms of recording the way your losses uh, come through, there's two ways to do it, um, and that digs in pretty far into it. Just, just know if you're using a discounted cash flow 
that there are uh, a slight there's a slight nuance in the guidance as to how you have to record things because you are discounting something yep. from an actual number. Great point. So Great point. just keep that in mind uh, for those with long-term assets out there. So jump, jumping into the next piece, determine your historical loss experience. We talked a little bit about this so far, and this is really a, the, your historical loss experience should align with how you pull your assets. That's yep. why the process starts with pulling of the assets. But talk a little bit about like data and kind of accuracy and completeness around that piece. Yeah. So we really think, and from what we've seen, uh, this is really the most um, time-consuming and difficult aspect of building this out. I think. People assume, well, I, I have data, I can go back and, and pull it, analyze it at any point in time I want to. Maybe true, but um, I think we also see for organizations that are at least, you know, doing internal control over financial reporting, it's difficult on a certain aspect, aspect and, and we see errors in current reconciliations or, or current reports that are being pulled from the current GL or subledgers let alone what happened to some legacy information that might be five, six, seven years old. And for a number of organizations, I mean, how different are they today than they were five to 10 years ago? So the data may be there, but once again, in, in the world you're living in, whether or not you're in scope for SOX, is that data the right data? Is it complete and accurate? How are you gonna prove that it's, it's really there? How are you really gonna pull it off of these legacy systems? Will it be detailed and granular enough that you can do it on a loan by loan basis with those characteristics that are there or for your trade receivables, the industry that that, that individual was with? Um, it, it's gonna be more burdensome for everyone than I think they, they would expect. And I'm just gonna, that's, that's where I'll be able to say everyone, and I don't wanna use that all the time, but I think this is the appropriate place to say everyone. So I would encourage people to pull that data. It's just like as we start saying, well, AI and data analytics, a lot of organizations have a lot of data, but what can you do with that data? Yep. So even if you say, yes, I, I have 10 years of historical data, I can prove it's complete and accurate. Okay, well, that's great. It's gonna take a lot of effort to be able to say that, but then also going from there, how do you analyze that data and break it down with the pools that you think you're gonna have for your instrument that's in scope today? Yes. So get moving on this. It's gonna be much more complex and time consuming than I think many people bargain for. Yeah, and you know, while the, the process starts with the pooling and goes to historical loss experience, you really need to know what your data looks like yep. before looking at your pools. Yep. So to Steve's point, understand your completeness and accuracy of your data. If you want to go with a certain pooling method, do you have the data to support that? Because you, you cannot go with a pooling method if you do not have the data to support it. So yep. you will have to take a look at your data first. And so that, you know, modeling and look back periods and things like that, to Steve's point, it could be a two year look back period because you had substantial changes. It could be a five year. You might have a 15 year look back period because you've had a steady state business for 15 years. Sure. Uh, and so keeping in mind, there's a lot of nuances when you're determining your historical loss experience, but there is not one prescribed way to do it. There isn't. There's a lot of judgment here. So there's going to be a lot of documentation from entities that are in, that are implementing CECL that needs to come around as to why the method you chose makes sense. Yep. And a good way to do that is use multiple look back periods. Look at different alternatives. Don't just pick one method and go with it. Let your auditors see that you have been thoughtful about this process instead of just picking one that you think works for you. Look right. at the other ones and look at the losses and see does that loss align with the expectations and with that pool. Great point, and I think we can we can talk about that on almost any slide in this presentation. You have the flexibility to do what you want to do, but no matter what, you have to support why. Yep. And for even those organizations that don't think it's going to impact their earnings or, or balance sheet, you may be right to a certain extent, but I think you're going to have to prove that out on all these different instances, and that will take time. Yeah. Um, and then once again, when you're developing this historical loss experience, the better and the more accurate that is, that's really the quantitative building blocks on where your reserve will be built from going forward. And that's where it will be easier for you, it will be less time consuming, your auditors will ask less questions, because if you have good and the right historical loss experience that reflects your current portfolio and pools today, you won't have to make as many adjustments going forward 
and maybe not have to forecast and build in some of those qualitative factors going forward where a lot of the judgment comes into play. So the better you can build this foundation through this historical loss experience will benefit and make things more efficient as you go forward. I absolutely agree. And I think we did actually receive an audience question around, um, you know, maybe this is a good point to interject. You know, what if you've never had any bad debt or write-offs? Um, how would you address that here? Uh, I, mean, I think my understanding is the FASB says that almost all types of receivables would need some sort of loss percentage on it. Yep. That, that expectation? I'm telling you, that that is the expectation. We talked about U.S. Treasuries that kind of got the, the zero loss, and, and that took a lot of time to maybe even think about and get people to buy in on that aspect. Um, once again, you know, it's, it's always difficult to use always and never, so there may be organizations that, that never, but once again, why is that? Um, the expectation is on day one, you will record some sort of loss. Now, it might not have to be a very large percentage or basis point of your outstanding receivable, but the expectation will be that you put something there on day one. Um, and that will be that maybe your historical loss experience has shown that that, that can support that you haven't, but how likely in the world in which we're living, or if you think about the credit cycle that we're in today, is this credit cycle like any other credit cycle in the past? You know, credit cycles, you can see them. If you if you map it out, it's interesting to see, you know, a, a credit cycle over, you know, seven to 10 years and how they, they go and move over that period. But this is an extended credit cycle. Not all credit cycles have the, the peaks and valleys that are consistent. And so even though your historical might prove that maybe you don't need much of, of a reserve, I think when you get to your current state evaluation and your forecasting, that will be very difficult to substantiate going forward in so much that, once again, the guidance as presented, and I don't think it's going to change very much when it's implemented, will be that you have a loss on day one, unless it's a U.S. type of security. Yeah, good points. So jumping into the next piece, and you know, there is, we talked a little bit about current supportable kind of reasonable forecast and bringing that into the process and now that's a requirement right. um, I think a lot of people had that built into their process but it wasn't part of financial statements because you couldn't bring it in under legacy guidance but talk a little bit about what that adjustment means um, and what is reasonable supportable yep well once again this, this is a good picture of what I talked about previously on the majority of your reserve should be built upon your historical loss experience to the extent that's possible uh, so we talked about the data limitations that might present that, but the, the more blue you can have, the better off you are because then it's more quantitative. I think people just overall feel better with something that is, is tangible that they can see and understand. When we build out to that orange piece of the graph, that's where we're going to start making some adjustments for the current state, adjusting my historical experience for what I know currently, and also where I think things are going on a forward-looking basis. Now, once again, Going back to the question, your internal data may support that you have very low loss or we'll assume maybe even never had a loss, but what about other types of, of companies in your industry or similar industries? Now, you're not required to go out and look at every type of avail available information that's out there. In fact, you're not even required to go out and look at external information. However, what I will say is your auditors likely will be, and that's where they'll say, well, your industry is showing or has shown some losses for types of receivables, no matter what they could be, and that will help, or that will be the rationale for why you will build um, a reserve on day one as you're building this out. Uh, so once again, the, the better you can have this historical information, the less judgment that will be needed to go forward, and there are numerous ways to build the, these current adjustments and adjustments going forward for your reasonable and supportable forecast. Um, you know, I think when everything was kicking off with this, people thought that a, a forecast, if it was going out for long-term receivables, could be up to five years. But then I think people got a little bit nervous with how accurate that will be and, and the big swings that could take place in the allowance. Because going back, a lot of organizations like smooth, predictable type of earnings to be out there, and that was one of the, the ways that the current model was built. This new model, some sort of expectation would be it's going to be big swings from period to period in building your reserve and the impact on earnings. Yep. So to think about that, people were saying, well, not only do I not want that, I'm not sure that I can really predict that out going to five years, so maybe three years is a more appropriate forecasting period. And then there's also discussion with organizations 
sophisticated organizations like Wells Fargo, who came out and said, I might just do it for one year, because that's the best I can do to accurately predict something going forward. So this is where judgment can take place. Transparency should be developed so a reader of financials can understand what is taking place. But the judgment factor and the inconsistency with the way that something like this can be built out will hopefully be a small portion of it, but really will be different um, from organization to organization. Agreed, agreed. You know, I think that something, you know, one of the questions we had um, was around how would you bring this into like a trade AR um, yeah. scenario? And I think uh, it's very unlikely given the short term nature that you're going to have uh, an adjustment yep. for reasonable forecast. Sure. But, you know, there, there are circumstances where you might have an adjustment. If you do, you know, maybe an example would be if you do a lot of business with, um, oil companies, maybe upstream producers, um, and then all of a sudden there is a, a large drop in the oil price, you might have to make an adjustment uh, based on those economic factors to your short-term receivables because there can be very quick losses that mount up in that case. But uh, I mean, Steve, I don't know what your thought is around short-term receivables. It seems like it'd be pretty unlikely that we're going to have very many adjustments for forecasts. That, that would be my expectation as well. I don't see anything that's indicating that it would be anything other than that. You know, in, in fact, one thing that I thought was interesting about the guidance that was out there, if you go to the standard and look at paragraph BC50, it says right in there that there's an expectation that you're allowed to make, you know, different bars of expectation given a level of sophistication for an organization. I think that we've always seen that from size of institution, public versus non-public, industry versus a different type of industry, but even the guidance that came out said there will be a different bar and set of expectations for the level of sophistication for an entity. Yeah. And I think that just as a further support on how long do you really have to go out and if you have more things that are short term in nature, you'll be adjusting down the curve as you currently move down the curve, but won't have to go out and forecast very far into the future or this is probably a good way to transition to the next slide where we talk about reverting to your historical loss experience if you can't adjust. Yeah, and I think that, you know the, the last part of the process, and this is really going to be particular to more of your long-term assets and your financing receivables, is you have to revert to a historical loss for the contractual term that is beyond what that forecast period is. So if you have a you know 30-year mortgage loan, but your forecasts only go two years, your adjustment's only going to be a short period of time within that 30 years. Right. So you've got to figure out how to. Get, regress that back to the overall historical losses, and you know, it, again, this is an area uh, that gives some judgment. You know, maybe talk a little bit about you know what is an immediate regression versus a, a straight line. Yep, and, and I won't talk about this too long. We can make a whole session out of this. It, it seems to be somewhat confusing, and so people tend to put it off and, and not talk about it right now. Uh, once again, as you mentioned in the forecasting, it, it'll be much more um, applicable to organizations like banks with longer-term receivables that are out there. Um, and we only have, according to the poll, you know, 5% of, the, of uh, our participants will be drastically impacted by this. However, you know, we do want to make sure that this is a component to think about and discuss because, once again, it's just what do you do? I'm required to look forward. I'm, I'm required to look into the future. Um, I'm required to think about what the contractual life of my receivable is. So if I am a type of organization that has long-term receivables and I can't forecast accurately more than one to three years, what do I do? So this is where they came and said, well, we have a solution for you. Go back and start going back to the information you have, the, the historical information that you know that you're using at the very beginning and foundation of your model. Revert back to that and start assuming that that information will be an indication of where the future is going to go, even though it's not likely to be the case, but it's kind of like a, a practical expedient to get back. Now, how do you get back there? Once again, you just have to to solidify why you think it's it's best to make kind of a cliff and fall off the cliff and go right back to that that historical loss experience, or do you want to get there uh, slower and over time, which probably makes the most sense in my opinion. Um, you're not really going to fall off a cliff very often unless you're forecasting some huge recession that's going to impact your organization. Um, but that's really what I'll talk about, and that we'll we'll conclude it for this presentation. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> Um, so if you if you do have the financing receivables, obviously this is a this is a key point for you. Um, so just just keep this in mind. Um, a lot of the participants on the webcast are focused on trade receivables, which this won't really have this aspect of the measurement process in it. 
So jumping into the third polling question here is, you know, now that we've been through the measure, measurement process, what part of the measurement process do you think will present the most challenges to your company? So determine unit of count, uh, B, method of estimating losses, C, historical loss experience, D, um, reasonable forecast, or E, reverting. So let me um, grab the third question here and we'll give people a little bit of time. Steve, I don't, I don't know what your expectations are around this question. Um, I'm thinking that based on who is on the webcast that a lot of people are going to say A and C based on what we've said, um, A or C, but you know, I would be interested to see what your thoughts are. No, I, I don't have any disagreement with that. Um, the only thing I would add is, you know, B, people should think about what method you really want to use and is that method, depending on the, the pools that you have, you may have only been using one method in the past, but once you really understand the type of receivables you have, it may make sense to implement another method or a different method for, yeah. for the different pools that you have, and each one may need a different method. Okay. Um, so it just depends on how you want to understand your business and how accurate and the time you have to invest on that and the sophistication you have. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll, um, we'll we'll close off the polling here and you know take a look at the results and see. Um, and actually, you know, a large portion um, of the group actually said adjust the historical losses for a reasonable forecast. And a lot of that could be around um, understanding what your forecasting process is for your assets. So a lot of company entities may not have a process for understanding these credit losses. So that's it's a to the point that we talked that Steve and I talked about earlier is. Use this as an opportunity to refine your process, improve your process um, for measuring losses. Previously, a lot of you know a lot of people just you, here's a loss rate, here's yep. a, here's an aging bucket. This is what we've done over time. It's not really refined, but ASC 326 actually tells you to look look at these units of account, look at how you're estimating losses, look at your historical loss percentage on a on a periodic basis, and reassess it. So use this implementation process for CECL as an opportunity to understand your business um, and understand the process and how you can change it for the better. I'm crossing my fingers and hoping that people won't have to invest that much time in adjusting that once they take the time and diligence, especially with the deferral that comes through, they will have time to find the right historical information to link it up uh, to make it an accurate reflection of their current portfolio. But I think that people are hearing the message that we are communicating and saying the, the relevancy or the availability of historical information may not be there in appropriate format and granularity to the pool of financial receivables that you have today. And so I think people are hearing the message. Yep, perfect. So we'll jump into a few other small considerations here. Um, one of the things that came up with the FASB is what about credit enhancements? Um, and for a, a lot of entities that I've worked with, especially in manufacturing, there are letters of credit involved. Um, and how should that be factored into the calculation? The, the FASB actually responded to that and said, you know, similar to what we said earlier, all types of receivables should expect to have a credit loss against them. And even if you have 100% of your receivable covered by a bank uh, through a letter of credit, that bank still has some sort of credit risk against them. So that the expectation is, while it might be very, very low, um, that you still have a loss against that credit enhanced receivable. Um, write-offs and recoveries, another area, these should be included in your historical data because that's part um, of your overall entity. Sure. Now, one term that's mentioned in ASC 326 is uh, write-offs should, de should determine when an item is deemed uncollectible. This, this is, again, an area of judgment. Uh, uncollectability is determined by the in each individual entity based on history. So a write-off occurs when something is deemed uncollectible and the entity has to determine what deemed uncollectible means to them. This is another documentation exercise, uh, but just keep in mind that those write-offs and recoveries need to be included in your historical data. Um, and the last piece, and this is one um, that it is a little bit confusing uh, because ASC 606 already has some credit worthiness built into it, but ASC 606 contract assets are in the scope of ASC 326. And what the interaction <clears throat> really is, is during the ASC 606 revenue process, you go through your five steps and you determine that it is probable I'm going to collect it, you recognize the revenue. But then there's a time factor that you need to assess whether that, that asset that you have on your books is actually going to be receivable. And that's where ASC 326 comes in, as of your balance sheet date. So the date of revenue recognition nothing really changes, but then when you 
future period, you're putting this on your balance sheet. You need to look at that contract asset and determine has something changed? Um, at, at, is there a loss that's now expected on that contract asset? Uh, so keep in mind that you're not going to change your 606 process that you've developed, but you will need to build these into and likely have them in their own pool um, as to how am I going to evaluate credit losses on contract assets that I have on my books. So this was a that was an interesting one. I think that um, there could be some clarification uh, around that. There's been a lot of questions with entities around how what does this interaction look like. Uh, so I would not be surprised if the FASB was to come with clarifications as they have in uh, certain circumstances. I'm glad that question is being asked now in advance of the adoption, so people are thinking about that. That's a great question and consideration to think through. Yep. So you know, to, you know, maybe we won't go in too far detail on these, but Steve, you want to touch on some of the high levels of some of the recent FASB tweaks? Sure. Yes. And I say, you know, people can investigate this a little bit further. Um, the the 2019-4, if you look at that, that's more applicable to banking. So it's not surprising why so many people think this is a seasonal banking bullying. A lot of that really addressed the, the loans and type of receivables a bank would have. So that, that's a fair assumption for 2019-4. For 2019-5 is a practical expedient that was put out there. So if you think this may apply to you, I'm not sure it would apply to many of the organizations that are on the call today, but you might want to dig into that one a little bit further. Then we would expect a different, another ASU to come out this year, uh, more so for the deferral of the effective date for the private companies that we talked about. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so moving along now, talk a little bit about disclosures, maybe the, the, the three main things that we have to do with disclosures in ASC 326 is um, understand the credit risk in the portfolio. How is, how is manage, mo management monitoring that, which you mentioned earlier? Um, what is the estimate of expected losses? Um, that would, would be normal as to a previous disclosure. If you had bad debt and things like that, you had to disclose that piece. And then how is that changing? So somewhat of a roll forward that you would have to do. Um, and I think the number one <clears throat> is that credit risk inherent in the portfolio and how is management monitoring? You're going to have to give a lot more data as an entity around that aspect of disclosure, where maybe previously you just had a, a, a one paragraph blurb and this got there, I think the SEC is going to expect that next level um, into how are you actually determining uh, credit worthiness and your credit losses. Yep, and it's somewhat sad that we're, we're talking about this last and towards the end. I think it's what a lot of people do as well. They think about disclosures as part of the financial reporting process. But at some point in time, you need to start thinking about it earlier in the process because this may also impact the, the level of data and historical data that you need for your evaluation of. Do you have the right data to prepare these tables that are going to be required? Yeah, and I think you can see some of here, some re required disclosures as well as some examples, uh, which we've talked a little bit about. I think understanding significant write-offs, um, if you have any sales or purchases of financial assets, so a lot of financial institutions, if you're maybe a servicer where you're um, selling those assets or you're you know, a, a fund where you're selling and purchasing different assets, you have to keep that in there. Uh, a roll forward of the allowance will be required um, as well as those management expectations. And I think that's going to be a tricky area for management. How, how much do you want to disclose, uh, especially those with long-term assets? Sure. As we discussed with short-term assets, you're probably not going to have a lot of that, but you still have to describe where, uh, what are your expectations if you have a significant industry focus or if a, a customer has an issue and you have a large amount of receivables from that customer, how are you evaluating that? So I think just understanding the methodology, um, this, is, this goes in line with 606 and 842. It's just expanded disclosures to understand more what a business is doing. Um, and so... I think starting to think through those items as part of the, the CISO process is what am I going to say about my process and my financial statements? That would be a, a key point to think about now. So la last polling question before we, before we finish up here today. Now that we've been through this, um, what do you think the impact is going to be um, for CISO on your company's financial statements? Um, so I, if you don't think it's material or uh, if you think it's insignificant, um, that's that, that's the possibility. Um, yes, it will have a significant impact. I'm not sure yet. Just need to just need to take a look. And I, I assume a lot of people here, you know, they're listening in because they need to understand more about uh, the standard. So I would expect a lot of people to answer not sure. Um, <clears throat> maybe one thing to understand here: if you're saying that it's immaterial or insignificant, how are you going to show your auditors that it is immaterial and insignificant? What have you done? to show that, uh, and it's early in the process for some of the private entities, but if you're a public company and you're saying 
this is immaterial or insignificant, I would expect those questions to start to come um, as you get to your 10K reporting for the current year. Um, you're going to have to disclose as part of your staff 74 disclosures where you're at with Cecil. Um, and so the auditors will be asking questions about that. So, be, you know, be prepared with documentation as to why um, your position makes the most sense. So we'll, we'll actually share the results here and see, see what came out. Um, and not, not totally unexpected, Steve. Um, the, the large portion of the audience is not sure we need to do more work to determine the impact. And that's part of what we were doing today is kind of laying that 30,000 foot framework um, yep. for you to, to dig in and where you think there will be issues. Um, but that's not too unexpected. And again, for the entities that say it's immaterial or insignificant, I would start to prepare that documentation for your auditors so that you can show, I've taken a look at this, I've evaluated alternatives, I understand um, what this CECL is doing to my financial statements and here's why it's immaterial. So I would be prepared for that. Yep. And that leads into the summary. I mean, the takeaways for today is if you're a public company, you better get moving on this if you haven't already. Uh, if you're a private company expecting the deferral, that's fine, but don't stop. Keep moving to the extent you can. Maybe you need to take a break for a second from 606 and 842, but keep moving and thinking about this and don't defer too long. That's not the point um, on why the deferral is put in place. Uh, if you're, hopefully we've convinced you today that you will be impacted in some way, shape, or form on this, and I would challenge you to start right now if you haven't already, start to see what kind of information you have from history, how accurate it is, how granular it is, and how that's going to link up with the type of receivables you have today and the pooling method that you expect to apply today. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Uh, again, thank you for everyone on the webinar today. Um, you will be receiving, if you've answered the four polling questions, you will be receiving both the evaluation and your CPE certificate. Um, if you do not, um, please feel free to reach out um, to using the River on website, and we'll be happy to get back in touch with you. Thank you again for attending. Um, look forward to the you joining the next ICS webinar. Thank you.